the Big Four. On the surface, their mission seems quite straightforward. To audit the world's largest companies with one goal in mind. Ensuring that the numbers align and that the books are honest. But beneath this facade lies a sinister truth. A secret that has eluded public scrutiny for far too long. I'm still somewhat shocked by the scale of what they've attempted to do and what, what they what they were caught doing. While the corporations they work for come and go, they themselves always seem to stay on top. The big four are enormously powerful. Their tentacles spread across the whole of big business, globally and locally. And that power is unchecked, untransparent, invisible. Today their original role as auditors generates only a third of their revenue. The rest is from a far more profitable source, one they provide to governments as well as the very same companies that they are auditing, consulting services. The big four have built a business that thrives on conflicts of interest. With more than a million employees active in 180 countries, they are everywhere. Under the guise of consulting, they infiltrate governments and write loopholes into tax reforms. How is it that you can sit in the room while tax laws are made and simultaneously you can be selling workarounds to foreign companies? Using their expert knowledge, they are the architects of tax avoidance schemes, creating loopholes, advising corporations on how to use them and then conveniently auditing those very same companies. Experts estimate that their schemes are costing society at least $1 trillion annually, which is effectively raising the tax burden for everyone else. While you diligently file your taxes, they are laughing all the way to the bank. Last year alone, they collectively made close to $200 billion in revenue. Who is really in charge here? It's not the politicians, and certainly not the taxpayers. Governments and corporations are dependent on them, and every attempt to limit their enormous power and influence has failed. But how did this happen? How did the big four become so powerful? And who truly pulls the strings behind their global dominance? To understand the rise of these behemoths, we must first travel back to their humble beginnings. It's the 19th century and big railway projects are all the rage. The industrial revolution is in full swing and the world is changing rapidly. However, there is a problem. The world of finance in this era is about as regulated as crypto firms who are located in the Bahamas today. It is filled with scammers trying to get rich from unsuspecting investors' money. How are investors supposed to know if a company is legit or just another elaborate scheme? The government realizes that trust in the financial markets is essential for growth and that juicy tax revenue. So they come up with a solution. The books of every publicly traded company must be checked by independent specialists. A new industry is born and the unstoppable rise of auditing firms begins. But little does the government know they just gave birth to a monster that will soon overpower them. In the beginning, everything works as intended. Countless independent firms pop up everywhere and are focused solely on the detection of fraud and keeping the books clean. Quick reminder by yours truly, if you want more videos like this one to pop up in your recommendations, be sure to subscribe to the channel. But as it soon turns out, auditing companies once and doing nothing for the rest of the year doesn't make for a great business. They quickly realize that they are leaving a lot of money on the table and decide to leverage their abilities another way for even more profit. The auditors already know the regulations and the companies they work for inside and out, so why not help them reduce their tax bill? They see the financial levers that could be pulled, the loopholes that could be exploited and the profits that could be maximized. A new, much more profitable line of business is launched consulting services. 
If my three years working in a management consulting firm in Europe, mostly on M&A and CGR topics, taught me one thing, it is, yes, consulting, it's a people's business, but it's also incredibly profitable and the industry keeps on growing. After all, why should the audit firms only work for the interests of regulators when they could be playing both sides? It is the beginning of a deep relationship between auditors and corporations that seems like a win-win, but as it soon turns out, it will have a catastrophic consequence for hundreds of thousands of people and wipe out billions of dollars. It is the story of how the big five that formed through mergers of the global auditing firms became the big four through a devastating event. It is the year 2000 and business is booming. Arthur Anderson, one of the big five, is billing its priced client Enron Corporation more than $1 million a week in auditing and consulting fees. After all, Enron can afford it. It is hailed as America's most innovative company and is Wall Street's darling. The energy trading company regularly refers to itself humbly as the world's greatest company and is comparable to Tesla or Facebook today. However, the story soon takes a dark turn as Arthur Anderson becomes increasingly entangled with their client. Again, consulting is so profitable that they are making more money consulting these companies than auditing the books. And their number one priority at this point is keep the client happy and keep billing. Enron soon recognizes its influence and starts pressuring Anderson's auditors. They resort to, let's say, questionable tactics, like locking an Anderson auditor in a room until he produces a letter supporting a massive $270 million tax credit. Partners at Anderson support this behavior as they are hooked on a relationship that is simply too lucrative to abandon. Pressured from Enron and their bosses at Anderson, the auditors find themselves in a tough spot. As Enron's financial dealings become more dubious, the pressure only intensifies. In August of 2001, even the CEO might have realized that they took things too far. As he resigns, the company reports a massive loss and sends the stock on a downfall. He knows this is the beginning of a catastrophic ending. In the following months, panic breaks out at Anderson. The shredders wear 24 hours a day on the 37th floor near the Enron Tower as paper cut hands feed them throughout the night. This isn't just a clean up, it's an all out eradication mission. Alongside with 30,000 emails, they destroy more than a metric ton of damning documents within three days. It is a desperate attempt to conceal their involvement in the biggest scam in US history. As it turns out, Enron just used creative or perhaps more accurate illegal accounting instead of innovative technology to generate its supposed profits. A few months later, they file for bankruptcy. The fallout is monumental. Tens of thousands of jobs are lost and billions of dollars in market value are destroyed. As Enron declares bankruptcy, they take Arthur Anderson with them, turning the big five into the big four. Only their consultancy branch survives and is known today as Accenture. But the industry has learned their lesson. In the years that followed, numerous auditing executives went to jail. The auditing profession was completely overhauled and Congress had no other choice than to remove conflicts of interest from the industry. Auditors were held to a higher standard and a new era of accountability began. Just kidding. While this crisis hurt many people and wiped out billions, this was just the beginning. What follows will be far more devastating, costing trillions of dollars and causing widespread misery. In September 2006, within the offices of the auditing firm Ernst & Young, a young employee diligently examines financial statements. 
These numbers belong to Lehman Brothers. The auditor is unaware that in just two years, this very bank will face a catastrophic collapse, marking the zenith of a global financial crisis. For now, all appears well. However, as he delves into the documents, a perplexing pattern emerges. Repo 105, an accounting technique, or more accurately, a financial trick, consistently appears. Its sole purpose? To manipulate the company's financial statements and conceal its true financial health. Skepticism takes hold of the young auditor. He recognizes the looming reputational and financial risk for Lehman. He seeks guidance from his superiors at Ernst & Young, inquiring if this aligns with regulatory guidelines. Unfortunately, his concerns seem to fall on deaf ears. By June 2008, the repo 105 transactions at Lehman Brothers surged dramatically, raising alarms even for the bank's deputy head of finance. At this point, the sums involved are in the tens of billions. He approaches Ernst & Young's top management with his concerns. As he mentions the staggering $50 billion figure, they maintain their poker faces. They take no action, as they are desperately trying to keep Lehman afloat. Merely days after this meeting, Ernst & Young signs off on Lehman Brothers' quarterly report. Despite auditors' clear knowledge of the bank's inflated figures by $50 billion, in January 2008, Lehman boasts its best financial results in company history, lavishing millions in bonuses. But we all know what follows. Do you remember as people were walking out with those boxes? The fourth largest investment bank on Wall Street. The fate of Lehman Brothers. The September 15th. That Monday. That Monday. Lehman Brothers collapse triggers a domino effect, culminating in the peak of the global financial crisis. To this day, Ernst & Young vehemently denies any wrongdoing, emphasizing that no court has convicted them. This is probably also the first time you even hear about the involvement of the big four in the collapse of the financial system. It is a global catastrophe estimated to have inflicted over 9 trillion euros in damages worldwide. Taxpayers worldwide had to bail out banks, with most of them being audited by the big four. And the financial world is littered with audit failures of the big four. For a good reason. They just don't care. That's because they make most of their money from other operations anyways. Once they truly excel at and probably also cause even more suffering around the world. They are the architects of global tax avoidance schemes, or maybe more accurately, semi-legal tax evasion. For the companies they work for, it is an amazing deal. A ready-made tax avoidance blueprint combined with the assurance that their in-house auditors will give it the green light. It is a strategy that reaps billions for both parties, while leaving the average taxpayer to shoulder the burden. One prominent example is the establishment of offshore shell companies, often in tax havens with minimal or no taxation. These companies serve as vehicles for rooting profits, allowing corporations to significantly reduce their taxable income. In the Panama Papers alone, a leak that exposed the tax schemes of global elites and multinationals, the big four, are mentioned more than 100,000 times. They have done more than any other group to sustain the global system of offshore tax havens and essentially hold a knowledge monopoly. Corporations, countries and public agencies, the big four work for everyone who can afford to pay them. Why shouldn't governments also profit from their vast knowledge? In 2014, the Australian government decides to do just that. At the time, they think they are making a smart move. But little do they know, they just entered a deal with the devil that they will come to regret deeply. It is 2014 and the government is frustrated by multinational corporations like Google, Facebook or Apple shifting their profits to tax havens and not paying taxes in Australia. They turn to the experts and consult with PwC to help put together fair policies and close the loopholes. 
But as it turns out, the consulting firm has other plans. While seemingly assisting the government in reforming tax laws, PwC is secretly hatching a far more profitable scheme. They leak the valuable and highly confidential government information about the impending reform inside the company. Here is a snippet from an internal email conversation. Awesome for our multinational anti-avoidance law defense work puts us in a great place. PwC then approaches the very same multinational companies the reforms are targeted at with a plan to help them sidestep the new laws. As the laws are passed, it is very clear that the corporations are already ahead of the system and the reform was all for nothing. Why on earth would the government hire the masterminds behind global tax avoidance to help solve a problem they themselves have created and are profiting from? It's like asking a wolf to mind the sheep. Before we explore how exactly the big four managed to infiltrate and harm governments around the world, let's talk about something that even the Australian government should have been more serious about, protecting your personal information and avoiding it from being leaked. I want to thank NordVPN for sponsoring today's video. Whatever you megalomaniacs are up to, their service lets you use the internet anonymously and internationally with my exclusive link in the description. Your internet traffic is always protected with robust encryption and unlike PwC, they don't track or share that information. I personally love the peace of mind when connecting to new Wi-Fi networks while traveling, knowing NordVPN is safeguarding my data. For example, I'm currently in New York, but thanks to their service, I can also still access sites and content that is normally just available in Europe. On top of all that, NordVPN is also the fastest VPN on the planet and you'll be safer with just one click. So go ahead and get NordVPN's two-year plan and four months for free at nordvpn.com slash megalomedia. It's risk-free due to their 30-day money-back guarantee. Click the link in the description below. Now let's focus on how the big four managed to penetrate governments, all while causing them and the people great harm. A former Big Four partner describes it as a Faustian relationship. The downward spiral looks like this. When governments keep hiring consultants because they don't have enough expertise themselves, they stop building up their own knowledge. This makes them rely even more on outside consultants and the cycle continues. The consequences are far-reaching. As we all know, they don't always do what's best for their clients. At the same time, they lure particularly skilled officials with lucrative offers and thereby keep raising the walls on their knowledge monopoly. In 2018, for example, two of the most renowned tax investigators in Germany changed sides by joining Deloitte, a road down a slippery slope, now that we know how loyal the big four are when consulting governments. Today the big four are omnipresent and more powerful than ever before. The enormous sums of money they handle seem to insulate them from regulation and scrutiny. However, when we consider their massive impact on the global economy, it raises questions about the efficiency of this system. These consulting giants cause an estimated $1 trillion hole in the pockets of governments around the world each year, all while their combined revenue doesn't even reach $200 billion. What would you do to tame these monsters if you could change the system? I'm curious to hear your suggestions in the comments. While the big four audit 99% of the biggest companies, click here to watch our video about BlackRock, the behemoth that owns a part of 99% of the world's biggest companies.